Thank you very much. Yeah, come on, Jenny. For inviting us to participate in this symposium at Otago University in New Zealand. So we are kind of in New Zealand a little bit right now. So, and there are about 30 people there, I think. So what I'd like to uh, talk about is um, mobile methods. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity because I'm quite obsessed with mobile methods at the moment. What, we've just uh, published a book on mobile methods and we've got the Mobility Lab and several projects that are trying to develop mobile methods. Um, so I'll just jump, jump right in. Hold still, don't move. With these words, the hero of William Gibson's um, cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer, is immobilised so that a neurosurgeon can fix his bioengineered capability to jack into cyberspace. So his bioengineered nervous system makes him a human data mining system, able to extract critical information from the data traffic that um, fuels modern life. And I'm very interested in this science fiction rendition of post-human evolution and the extension of human capabilities. But I'd like to start with a critique of this approach in the social sciences. Hold still, don't move is what analysts all too often impose on the phenomena they study. We transcribe conversations, um, map move movements, code responses. We seek to present expert analyses. We isolate and pin things down for very good reasons, but many existing social science methods deal very poorly with the fleeting, here today and gone tomorrow, the multiple, distributed, found here and there, and not in between, um, things that take different shapes in different places. Also, our methods struggle with the non-causal, chaotic, complex, the sensory, emotional, spiritual, and the kinesthetic. And that's not just a matter of oversight. These are not peripheral phenomena that can be, regrettably, but without much consequence, left out from analysis. The mobility's turn shows how the transitory, mobile and immobile are the very engine of social order. So more than 100 years ago, for example, Georg Simmel, a key sociologist at the time, recommended a thoroughgoingly mobile empirical method because he argued social orders are in continuous motion, like the rainbow persists despite or actually through the constantly changing position of its water particles. Reality itself is in flux. And though we may lack the ability to see that directly, mobility makes worlds. And the screenshot that you see behind there is an example of how movement and blocked movement make the social and material worlds we see. It's also an example of new instruments to study flux with. And I'll show you the trailer of the BBC TV series Britain from Above. Using satellite tracking and groundbreaking computer imaging, we can watch for the first time on television the great migrations across our landscape. The maritime motorway that screams through the English Channel is revealed. Yeah, the BBC has also had its eye on the frantic pace of London life. These are the GPS traces of 400 London taxis. Watch how, when the major thoroughfares become saturated, they spill out into the back streets hunting for clear routes. The GPS traces of every single plane entering British airspace over 24 hours. You can see how they follow the strictly laid out routes and the stacks of aircraft circling, waiting to land. And this is a map of British chatter, a representation of our national telephone network as it comes to life on an average working day. The activity of every exchange in the country, trapped second by second. So that's, that's a TV program made for popular consumption. But some critics argue that methodological innovations like these based on GPS and cell phone tracking, and also mining of terabytes of data of virtual traffic, 
um, on communication and consu con consumption patterns is actually overtaking the academy. So Savage and Burroughs argue that academic social science is now marginal in a huge research machine where circuits of information still orchestrate just-in-time moves on markets worldwide, although knowing capitalism now seems a misnomer that they use here. So here are two very good reasons to develop mobile methods. First of all, what can social scientists do to help societies understand the collective cumulative phenomena of moving on such a scale as we are and the social order in flux? And secondly, how can mobile methods go beyond mindlessly fueling knowing capitalism and go towards constructively critiquing it? What methodological innovations are required and are emerging and what more is needed? So I'm going to give a concrete background to that discussion with a small pilot project that we're running at the moment where we face intriguing methodological challenges. So I'll introduce some mobile phenomena and I draw on this book um, that we've just published um, and I draw on some of the chapters in the book but also other sources um, and discuss ways of studying mobile phenomena. Um, so we're an interdisciplinary team um, combining criminology, um, social science and design. And Chris came to me about a year ago um, and he wanted to study how the social life of small urban spaces had changed since the influential studies of um, urban planner William White. White um, was troubled by the fact that developers um, were being paid, it was in the 1970s, they were being paid to put up um, plazas when they put up office buildings. And he was worried about that because most of the time those spaces didn't work. They were empty almost all of the time and White went out to study what actually made public spaces work. And he and his team used time-lapse photography from high vantage points, which meant that they could trace the impact of things like the sun and larger phenomena like um, flows of people. They also used um, survey maps and photography and video on the ground. And some of the things they observed are that where lots of couples and um, groups gather, you also have lots of individuals. The most common activity in the 1970s was girl watching, so you just saw that. Then you get things like this, um, sort of orbiting conversations where people have a conversation but they don't stay put, they sort of wander around the space as they're doing it. Um, lovers don't hide in the background, they actually seem to enjoy the front stage, including main thoroughfares like um, street corners, uninhibited by the people around them, like these people um, checking whether they've got salad stuck in their, their teeth um, at, the, at the traffic lights. Indeed, people um, stop so much in the main thoroughfares that it can be difficult to get through. And conversations also happen right in the middle of the flow of people. You can observe that on campus as well, actually. And these um, disturbances in traffic, White argues, play a very important role in the many chance encounters you see, or you used to see, in cities. And many theorists connect such focused and unfocused encounters with diverse others, with the very humanity of cities. However, government's interaction order, that is the social practices, procedures and principles that organize these encounters are being transformed. And with our project, we're asking um, why is it happening? How is it happening? What's actually changing? and what's good and what's bad about it. Um, so one of the crucial issues that Guthman observed was how co-presence carries a moral obligation for involvement. So when you were out in public in the 1970s, you were obliged to make contact with others on a quite casual basis, and it would be casual contact. You wouldn't necessarily speak to these people. 
but you would meet young and old, um, different ethnicities, um, different backgrounds. And that contact <clears throat> was very strongly associated with a morality of public civil life. And that is arguably changing. So from the very start, um, it's clear that you need mobile visual methods to study this. And one first order principle of conduct in public is that it has scenic intelligibility. So um, we can identify situations like a game, which looks very different from a group conversation in the same square. And we can fit our own actions and movements around these um, recognized scenes. And normally this is facilitated by civil inattention. And we, so it means basically we don't stare at strangers. And when I took that picture, I broke that rule, basically. And they look at me puzzled. Um, and a lot can be done by modulating civil inattention. So a stare could also be a sign that I'm taking pictures for a website, for example. Or it could be a cry for help, I might not feel very well. Or it could be disapproval. So, um, and this, the meaning of these things is very difficult to study. And I'll show you an example from a music video. Um, So what's happening here happens very fast, and it happens on the move. Um, and what this encounter is, or what could become, is not just in the look, in the sort of slight flirtatious glance that she does there. It's actually in the whole situation. A glance is, or becomes, what it is, um, through what people do before and after, and how they react to each other. So this situated unfolding of meaning makes for a compulsion of proximity. To really understand what someone else is made of, people need to be co-present. That's no easy situation. People say stupid things or um, unwittingly disclose dishonesty and so on. But through being with others on the spot like this, People actively generate trust, respect, emotional bonds. So these are things that people don't mysteriously somehow feel towards each other. They actually practically achieved in and through the interaction. And through the way in which people modulate these interaction order principles of scenic intelligibility, um, civil inattention, and um, sequential organization and spatial organization towards you. So critics like um, Sharon Zukin or um, Zygmunt Bauman argue that the production of civility is undermined by consumerism, the privatization of public spaces, and the creeping securitization of these spaces. And reflecting on a visit to the Place de la Défense in Paris, Bauman adds another factor. He says, this place, emphatically, this place embodies all the traits of the public, yet emphatically not civil urban space. For Bauman, the Place de la Défense is an iconic manifestation of the emptying out of public space that has contributed to an erosion of civility and also an erosion of capital P politics. So citizens increasingly see themselves as individuals by right in democratic societies, in control of and also responsible for their own individual life choices. And that's individualization, Bowen argues, actually makes it very hard for people to become individuals de facto, that is, with real life choices and real opportunities for a good life. And that's because Individualist forms of life make people see risks and opportunities as biographical, as down to themselves, 
and not as systemic contradictions disabling politics. So, at first glance, a somewhat nostalgic tour through transformations of the interaction order seems to chime with this. So the compulsion of proximity seems to be transmuting into a compulsion to be connected. People highly value the ability to micro-coordinate with others on the move, like you're going to get the milk, or you're going to get the coffee, and um, we're going to meet there before we go home, or things like that. Um, and especially they like to coordinate with people who are like them. So people you already know through other friends on Facebook, um, um, friends, family, and work colleagues. And they do this at the price of ignoring those nearby. So overlay connections with like-minded people or people like them over a shared presence with diverse others evading the moral obligation for involvement with them. Um, and some even have become, some people argue, um, dependent on instant feedback from um, full-time in intimate communities that they're connected with 24 hours a day. Then this image really rather um, romanticizes it, but Bauman has a point when he says that Public space used to be a space where life politics could connect with big capital P politics. So politics used to be a topic like the weather that people could moan about quite legitimately to, to, to people they don't know, strangers. And today, many people enact what Raymond Williams calls mobile privatization. So retreating from public spaces into digital bubbles created with laptops, mobile phones, iPods. So rather than acknowledge others with curiosity, people seek association with distant others. So this guy sitting like a beggar on the street could actually be a sociometric star with lots and lots and lots of connections on Twitter um, and um, only a few mutual ones, which is what would characterize him as a sociometric star. Um, and this disrupts another important interaction order principle. Without technological extensions, people can put themselves in other people's shoes. So um, these two women can know what the photographer is taking a picture of. Because we have something called reciprocity of perspective. So we assume that the world is the same. Of course it's not. Physiologically I might be short-sighted or culturally I come from a different background. And also, you know, the world looks different from where I'm standing now, where you are. But we assume that for all practical purposes, we are in the same world, and if you put yourself in my shoes, you would see the same as I do. The use of mobile technologies undermines that reciprocity of perspective. Each of these people is in an encounter with another that's invisible to us. So you can't put yourself into their shoes. And at the same time, morally, they're not involved with, with the people who are there. They might be talking about private affairs, loudly being annoying. Um, and they're also making things available that some others may find very interesting. So John and um, King, John Ory and Kingsley Dennis argue that digital traces could enable mobile surveillance on an absolutely unprecedented scale a Faustian bargain with possibilities for this kind of Orwellian surveillance. However, by not really paying enough attention to the everyday practices of physical and virtual mobilities, theory can miss important critical opportunities. So take surveillance, for example. Um, it's not the first time that societies are experiencing a revolution in surveillance. Here one contemporary says, this light permits total surveillance by the state. The utopian dream of nights lit up was transformed into a nightmare of light from which there was no escape. And people are experiencing something similar now, but like these people, they're not passive in the process. So this is a... Um, a transcript of a texted conversation between two Mogi players. And 
Mogi is an augmented reality treasure hunt game. So uh, people move through cities with their GPS enabled phone um, and they're collecting virtual treasures. And it's, it's a real commercial game. Um, it's played by thousands of people in Japan. Um, and without explicit design intention behind it, the designers made it so that the game displays other players on your screen. So these are people you don't know, all you have in common is that you all play Mogi. Um, and the screen covers an area like a small town, say, so that means that if you can see someone on your screen, that means that they're actually physically close. So if you've got something in common and you're physically close, then the obvious implication is, well, why, why don't you meet up? And that's exactly what happens here. So A says um, by text, this evening, and note also the emoticons there, we're very close, aren't we? And B, after a couple of minutes, replies, well, yes, we are very close. And then another two minutes later, A says, oh, you run away with three disappointed smileys. And she replies, um, oh, it's because I, I got onto the Maranucci line. Um, so Christian and company's colleagues study a lot of examples of these really elaborate negotiations that people engage in to avoid face-to-face -face contact. And later on in this conversation, B says, maybe one was just to run away when one gets so close. So clearly the idea of meeting virtual acquaintances provo provokes anxiety. And what this illustrates, amongst other things, is how people are, in and through interaction, adjusting to their digital shadows. People are learning how, when they use digital technologies, they are present in different spaces. So new kinds of interaction order practices and principles are emerging here, so you could call this a form of virtual civil inattention, which with the right kind of um, support might actually also evolve into new capabilities of dealing um, and, and developing new sensitivities around surveillance. So there are parallels to how, when electric light was introduced, people got used to their shadows and actually used it for navigation around people as well. Um, and people can be, understanding things like this allows you to be creative with it. But unfortunately, technologies are currently, usually, not at all designed to support this kind of social innovation. On the contrary, most design philosophies are about making technologies invisible, um, embedding them into the environment, connectivity is invisible, GPS location tracking is invisible, and there's no attempt to make it visible. And this is one area where mobility research could really make quite a big difference. So we're also investigating other examples of transformations of the interaction order, including this really chilling example of people working out on Facebook who was killed and who wasn't at uh, Virginia Tech, the Virginia Tech University shootings. And they did that, they, they worked out who'd been killed well before the authorities released um, names. Or this one here, um, the 2004 Madrid bombings, when almost a quarter of the Spanish population, that's 11 million people, organized on the hoof online um, demonstrations in public spaces to protest against the Spanish government's jump to the conclusion that ETA was to blame for, for the bombings. Uh, we're also looking at more frivolous examples like augmented reality games like um, I Love Bees and I, I won't go into this too much but what's interesting to note here is that people are, some people are very enthusiastic about this idea of collective intelligence and this smart well, ability to uh, connect to other people and organise um, whereas some of the people who actually work in these games point out that a huge amount of orchestration and organization has to happen in the background to actually make that possible. So, and they call themselves puppet masters, which is quite a, an interesting way of, of putting that. 
So the question is then, how do we study the changing um, interaction order and how, how it performs and how it actually reconstitutes society and politics? So we're in the middle of analyzing this, so it's too early to talk about huge insights, but I can describe how we've used mobile methods. So for example, how to study the fleeting, the flirtatious glance, but also things like um, happy crowds pouring out of a, a nightclub, which in the day looks really shabby, um, or cafe furniture being moved in and out. Um, so we have been analytically tuning ourselves into these um, ephemeral phenomena with the Derif, and um, some of you actually already, most of you know, but it's a situationist art practice where um, groups, we move in groups of two or three, and one person leads following arbitrary rules, which means that you're taken into spaces that you would otherwise not um, go to if, if you were following, you know, if you had a plan, you wanted to go shopping, you go somewhere, you have a map that you follow, you uh, avoid certain spaces, and the derif takes you into the nooks and crannies of, of cities. Um, so that also means that the people, people following can completely free themselves from, from concerns of where they, where they need to go next and tune themselves to notice these, these ephemeral things of glances, um, smells, um, transitory um, things. So we've also taken um, video from above and I'll play that in the background. We, we were sat in a, a cafe um, filming the space from above. And what you you see here is this if you notice if you pay attention to this woman here, she's um, gonna meet somebody. And then also see this one here. Um, she's in a conversation quite a, she, she did it for about 40 minutes or so um, with a friend who had a major um, crisis. I spoke to her afterwards, I went after her and, and interviewed her. So, and another one that you see here, she's a, um, a charity, uh, she's asking for money for, to support a, a charity. So, what you, what, so initially what we're noticing here is that there are very different territories that kind of intersect. So here you, you'll see her, her and her friend meeting up there. So she sort of owned that space and they've worked virtually sort of pulled each other together there. Well, she's the, the, the we call them pacer, the people who just pace up and down on the, on the phone, owning a certain space, and she's also owning a certain space. Another approach that we're taking is um, this, where we've got a, a head camera, and we're actually following um, people and to, to see how pedestrian traffic, for example, is organized through the orientation that you take to other people. So here you, you'll have uh, this guy just overtook. And to what, what's really striking about it is it's actually very surprising that people don't bump into each other more. So to see what they are actually using to avoid collisions between each other. And the, this mobile method um, people talk about in terms of anticipatory following. So as you're um, moving in the traffic and you're recording it, you are actually also oriented towards these cues and little hints that allow people to avoid collisions and you're recording them as you're doing it. So, um, those are very interesting things. And, um, <clears throat> Of course, we're also very interested in the virtual mobilities that people are actually engaging in. So we're interesting, interested in who do they connect to, who do they talk to, what do they talk about, um, how do they participate in online communities. And um, Alexandra Weilemann has done a, a really nice study where they've recorded teenager conversations, so they've asked them to turn on the recorder when they had a conversation on the phone. And uh, Christian Nikop and his colleagues use a similar method um, and we've got people who signed up to, to allow us to do this, so that's the next step in the project. 
Um, but to get people engaged in that sort of quite intimate research, you actually have to also make it worthwhile for them. So what we're doing is obviously of public interest. I mean, everybody should be interested in the nature of public space and how it, um, the, the opportunities and challenges it poses to political uh, interaction, not just big capital P politics, but also the civility of, of the spaces. So um, what we're, we're doing there is we're organizing a workshop in June with members of the public, um, planners, um, technology designers, um, and commercial telecoms uh, companies, anyone who has an interest in the, the changing interaction order. And some people are also using um, time-stamped digital location and communication records. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can follow it up with, there's a chapter in the book, but there's also other things. And Rainer Haas and his colleagues um, in Estonia are doing this on an absolutely massive scale. They're, they're, so you can, you can use these sort of timestamp things from, if you're working with computer scientists, you can get it from them, but also commercial institutions like um, Orange, Free, all the telecoms operators actually have these data available. Of course, it's an ethical question of how do you get access to it, but if you can, and they, they manage to, to get this, um, you can actually um, track and trace, um, here they're looking at commuter traffic in and out of Tallinn with 600,000 people having allowed them access to their data. You can also um, investigate emotional and sensory aspects of inhabiting spaces. So Marion Walker and Paul um, have worked with children to understand their journeys to and from school. And they asked them to send annotated pictures to local, which we've also used um, ourselves. And the pictures are not necessarily of the journey or the, the experience that they have there and then, but also of larger things that they're concerned with. And they can really enrich subsequent interviews with people. Um, and this can scale up really nicely and in an exciting way, I think. So Christian Nold, um, biomarking, he asks people to wear skin sensors that measure the electricity on your skin, which gives a, an indication of the emotional ar arousal that you, you're experiencing. And then uh, maps them, their movement through the city. So at a really busy traffic crossing, you can see that people's arousal spikes up. Um, And putting quantitative data together with such um, qualitative insights, it becomes possible to piece together really rich descriptions of the diverse ways in which sensory perceptions and emotions are practically done. It's of course also important to remember that actually much of what we're doing with mobile methods is not um, completely new. We're not completely inventing this. Actually, in the 1940s and 1930s, um, people like William, William White um, studied street corner societies, or um, Turnbull walked with Mbuti pygmies through the rainforest to understand how they understand their world. So it requires a sort of um, um, going native, so learning through actually putting your feet on the ground with other people, moving with them, to understand how, how to see how they understand the world. Um, that's a, a critical counterpoint to um, stepping back analytically with views from above. And I'm really taken by the power of art and design interventions also to, to study the multiple. So especially around ideas for tracing the emergence of a new kind of uh, political. For example, the Future Everything Festival in Manchester in 2008, Drew Hammond um, curated a number of artworks that literally unplugged social networking technology. So they made a physical Facebook and they made a physical MySpace where people created boxes that were their profile and they put them in a shop window where people could post 
physical paper little messages to each other, which really revealed a lot of the underlying assumptions of you know what happens when you want your profile deleted. That it it really sparked some understanding of what has to happen. So do you just take the box out and put it behind the desk, or do you actually take it apart and make it possible for other people to reuse the material, or do you just completely shred it? So um, those kind of art interventions around um, <clears throat> these issues trigger reflection and participatory collaborative analysis with members of the public of um, what these things imply. And these um, are often, I mean, in that instance, there, there were several of those kind of interventions happening all over Manchester. And we use crowd ethnography, so a team of ethnographers working in different places to um, understand what's going on and how that also hangs together as, as a whole festival. And then I'd also like to include kind of self-ethnography things, so cultural pro probes is one example, uh, Bill Gaver from the Royal College of, College of Arts, then they sent packs to people with postcards and little probes that they could fill in and return to the researchers with some uh, ideas and observations that they made. Right, now something that I'm, I'm getting to the end as well, so you're looking a bit tired, but um, something that I'm really, really interested in, um, the kinesthetic, the sense of how we are in space. It's a muscular sense, but it also involves balance in all the other senses. Um, and with the convergence of digital datascapes, location services, ubiquitous connectivity, with physical spaces, people's sense of embodiment is changing. In, in a way, they're finding new moorings, if you will. And as I mentioned, that's done in a world where the dominant design philosophy is to make technologies invisible, as in this vision by Siemens. So um, they see a pervasive backbone of technologies servicing people. So for example, um, a, step of, uh, a set of stairs will turn into a ramp on, just on approach of a wheelchair. Or um, if you discover a problem at work, um, it can automatically connect you to the people involved wherever they are. Or you can have your food ordered on the basis of biosensor data. And this kind of invisible computing is still the dominant design vision. But how can people make sense of this kind of thing happening if it's invisible? How can you find your moorings in this? And gaining a better understanding of this is absolutely critical for realizing positive potential around new socio-technical practices and dealing with the dangers. So I can talk about how to study this, um, but I'll draw things together now. I think it's critical to understand that people, politicians and societies are already experimenting with this on an absolutely massive scale. So our use of technology today is a massive breaching experiment that allows us to see how things are that we took for granted, but um, that also um, enable social innovation of developing new ways of um, interacting with, it, with each other. And these things very quickly become second nature, so this is a moment in time where it's a really opportune um, moment to study how things are being transformed. And this transformation is chaotic and complex. And the role of social science, in my view, is to enable societies to experiment more carefully and more consciously. And there are a number of concepts and approaches that are powerful here, like collaborative experimentation that comes out of science and technology studies, where citizen science is being used to engagement with people around really complex issues such as genetics or um, information technology is made in a way that 
these people have a say in how these technologies are being developed. So participatory design is another example where pe people are developing technologies in collaboration with the stakeholders, with the professionals and the publics that will be using these technologies. And you can think of the, our use of technology at large as a living laboratory, but there are also um, deliberate um, spaces like the Future Everything Festival is designed as a living laboratory to experiment with cutting edge technologies. Um, and of course that has implications for what kind of social science we do. We, in my view, should really get involved in these kind of activities, collaborating with people. So some of my colleagues say they study these new technologies and they criticize them and they point to the dangers. And that's, in some respects, the work that John does. And I think it's very important to do that, but it's also very important to get stuck and get stuck in and actually try to formulate, help formulate how things could be better. It's not enough to just say, this is dangerous. So why do we need mobile methods for that? So I think that um, in general, we, through the social science that we do, we've observed that there's a failure of approaches for, to design analysis, governance, that are based on a notion of control, of understanding enough information and then informing something, informing change and then doing something about it. That sort of linear, linear model isn't working. And mobile methods, by putting you on the ground with people, um, making you move with people, get moved by what they do, also create new objects of knowledge, um, especially around the flows, flux, and the performativity of mobilities that allow us to come in on it. And, um, well, kind of, uh, with the danger of revealing myself as a bit of a romantic, this is why, for me, um, I'm really um, afraid sometimes and mostly humbled by the scale of the challenges and opportunities that we face. Um, um, today. And in 1990, Carl Sagan, uh, an astronomer and broadcaster, asked the NASA controllers to take this photograph from the unmanned Voyager 1 as it turned back to Earth. So this is what Earth looks like six billion kilometers away from space. So as humans extend their reach to such distance, Sagan says, Look at that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you know, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. Our planet is but a speck in the dark, in all this vastness. There is no hint that help will come from elsewhere. And the fact that responsibility for this is ours makes mobile science, social science absolutely critical, I think, because mobile methods can take us beyond control because they provide instruments to see the world in motion, to make sense of flux, to move with, to be moved by objects, data, and to be moved to do something to make things better, however collectives may define that. And they pull into full view why control isn't working and open up new forms of experimentation design and science. And I'll end with a quote from Bruno Latour calling for a radically careful and carefully radical design. Okay. Thank you very much. We could we could have a few questions if you wanted. Or comments. Um. You showed us these pictures by, by White, showing mm -hmm. these huge plaza buildings. And um, the main point of your talk was about new softwares and, and new digital technologies. So I'm interested, how can you address or do you address in, your, in the project like changing architecture or the, the, like the 
the more the more concrete materiality of places. Um, well, at the moment, only in the sense that we're considering that a lot of the technology is actually either and kind of almost embedded like this with big screens on city square. So we've looked at how um, public, how people orient to big screens in public squares, um, and also in relation to how they perceive their connectivity. And the, for example, people are, people are talking a lot about their movement in the city being determined by where they can get Wi-Fi or not. And they, they can see where they can get Wi-Fi by lots of people being on their laptops in a cafe, for example. Or there are also instruments that you can use now, like um, WorkSnug as a software that you can have on your... It's like augmented reality on your phone that you can sort of wave around the city and you can see where, where there's connectivity or not. So only in that sense at the moment, but with, at this, with this workshop in June, we would really like to get urban planners and architects involved in the project. Hmm. Okay. Um, I just saw in the media the other day uh, an excellent example that seems like an opposite to that moggy um, networking tool, which is mm -hmm. in China called Human Flesh Search. Um, it's a strange name, but it basically means that um, the, the authorities will track down people who release information anonymously, and it's often through vigilante groups as well. And so people who actually think they're anonymous online um, end up culpable um, due to these kind of vigilante searches which go on quite dramatically, I think, you know, drawing on lots of different resources and stuff. So it's kind of the opposite, really, where people think they're anonymous, but they're actually not. Yes. Well, that's, that's why I think it's um, a huge challenge that we come up, not just with technological solutions of making those kind of tracking and tracing activities visible, that it's also, also a matter of socially and materially making them um, visible in some way. And people being more sensitive to them, yeah, scary. Mm. Mm -hmm. And following on the type, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, yeah, the Japanese uh, game. And uh, just to remind me of uh, one of the research several years ago, I just uh, by accident was saying that in China, the internet law come by, by the people, for example, through Amazon or something like that. But the relationship be, be between the uh, strangers are easily locked on, um, but at the same time, it's broken. So it, it's a, on the personal level, it's a very interesting phenomenon that a lot of people is just uh, mad with each other on the uh, video uh, met through this method. And, uh, but at the same time, the relationship is uh, rather uh, vulnerable in a way. But I don't know whether such accumulation of such a matter or, or, the, or the scale to finally reach a point and bring a totally different uh, outcome, like just uh, what you mentioned, the, 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 it's a, uh, yeah, just a searching on the uh, massive power of uh, just uh, people and just searching on that for a, a topic. It's lead to a micro, if uh, I would say, effects that never, no one expected. So it's a, to me, it's really a chaotic situation. It's very fascinating. On the one hand, it's as to individual, it seems to be nothing, and then uh, certainly we have what we come, what we think it's very important to us, more and more important. But on the other hand, you can see your life still lock on the. Original major social network of the relationship, and with this as a facilitating, uh, 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 how to say, a tool or just make it. But I'm just keeping see that it's coming up as a what kind of scale finally it's a lead to, uh, lead to a micro uh, effect, social effect. So it's very fascinating. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we've thought about that, that, that there are examples of, um, like Claire Shirky writes, writes about how um, this ability to connect to other people is being used for these kind of smart mobs things. 
And in, in oppressive regimes, people can organize, for example, to all go out and have an ice cream on this square, which is seen by the government as unacceptable resistance. And then they come out and arrest these people, and that gets media attention. But it's much harder to see how that kind of connectivity can create the political possibilities for people to do something in societies like this, where you know, it tends to, those kind of smart mob things tend to focus on really f mm, frivolous, just playful kind of things. Mm. I just want to say that uh, since I come to England, this presentation is one of the few studies I really admire and I like it because we have been forgotten to analyze social relations around some objects like public sphere or technology like mobile phones and you also include the uh, movement inside it. I just mm -hmm. want to say that it makes me so happy and let me to bleed back in social science. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, uh, um, we're in the analysis phase of the project now, so we, we've got some, it's, like, it's only a pilot project, so we haven't done huge amounts of research. We've done three, three days since of field work in, in Manchester. And, um, uh, so I, I, I'm, at the moment, I'm really a bit dissatisfied because I find it very difficult to connect our understanding of how interaction is organized in the public spaces with the big questions of what kind of politics does that make possible and, and yeah so it's great to do but um, I look forward to making an analytical step change now to see what we can do with it. And I think that June workshop also will be quite important to see what people who are at the coalface of designing these kind of technologies and these spaces and um, urban planning um, on, on a larger scale of how to connect these spaces and um, how they, what they are concerned with and whether they are actually concerned with issues of surveillance or not and what kind of ideas would come out of that. Yeah. I'm uh, focusing on the open UK at the moment, on um, UK cities, British cities, or, uh, and I'm thinking of expanding this to other countries. Yes, 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 we're doing, we've studied Manchester basically and a few other little places, but we would very much like to expand that, yeah. yeah I think we're going to have to. Thank you ever so much for coming to this. It's been much, you know, much nicer. Than